Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Divyanshu Pandey. Joining me online is Prashanthi Vinod and Aditya Singh, the hosts for today's event. We have gathered this evening to enrich ourselves on the idea of law and society through an interaction with an eminent personality who knows the subject the best. We have carried a constant approach towards learning by interacting with leaders of the contemporary time. Earlier, we have had amongst us business gurus, biotechnologists, professors, social entrepreneurs, and psychologists, and many more unsung heroes that make the world a better place to live. I am glad to share a similar kind of space with someone of that sort. Uh, Sir is a rank-holding economics graduate from Oswania University, and he has a law degree from Chennai. Sir has been a practicing lawyer for over four decades and a part-time journalist over three decades. And he has a passion for debates, Hindi films, classical music, and quizzing. So thank you so much for joining in, sir. We're very eagerly looking forward to have a conversation with you. Uh, two years ago, uh, I was a of uh, U.S. Angarsh, which is a national level youth leadership contest conducted by Vivekananda Institute of Human Excellence, Ramakrishna Math, Hyderabad. So at this point of time, I would also like to convey my pranams to Swamiji because through Swamiji and through VIHE, we came to know about uh, Sir as well. And I was also this one of the Corona batch getting roasted and toasted uh, through Sir. So, um, so definitely, as a uh, student of international studies, political science and history, and as well as your student in um, uh, semi-finals and finals, now very eagerly looking forward with the team I'll be to converse with you, sir. So over to Divyanshu. Thank you, Aditya and uh, Prashanti for those uh, whatever they are. Hmm. So this evening we have gathered here to literally learn from you. We have a lot to ask, but uh, I think I will start from the very basic. I recall a conversation from the book uh, written by, written on Aristotle and his disciples, where two of the friends are fighting uh, about the idea of anarchy and lawlessness. And the concern is that those who do not pay the taxes are always better off, and we who are following rules are left with nothing. But the conversation that follows talks about how important law is for a societal setup. How intrinsic is law, just like the soul, just like the heart, just like the nerves of a human body, soul is equally important in a society. So I would like you to start with the idea of law and society. Well, uh, Divyanshu, I have a seemingly contradictory view on the whole story. As a citizen, I believe that we must all be law abiding because those are parameters of social behavior. But I also believe that the best government is the least government. That governments must be very little laws so that the space for human existence must be far and wide. Meaning that today we have a extreme state controlled life. Law determines how many children you must have. Law determines where you must stay, how many rooms your house should have, how much plinth area you must live in, how much of water you must drink, how what air you must breathe, where you must study, what you must do, everything connected intricately somehow or the other to the law of the land. Now, this is a disconcerting factor because we, on the one hand, look at ourselves as a functional democracy. And as lawbreakers, India has finally turned out to be a functional anarchy. Uh, Robert McNamara, who called it that, dubbed India as a functional anarchy. So the paradox is quite clear. The more the laws, the more the laws to break. Having said this, the route to civilization, of course, is the understanding of human limitations societal requirements or societal designs. So as long as there are social designs meant for what we today euphemistically call the common good, they are bound to be at some point in time restrictions or parameters of human action designed to a puppetry called law, as a consequence of which state action 
is in an ever expanding scope directly proportional to the uh, reduction of the human liberty space. That is why probably many people think that the 19th century was a golden era. Well, you know, artists, creators were all in their own space, creating new, uh, new inventions, new art, new forms of life. They built up an entire, you know, the Renaissance came during that period. So uh, it created so much of creativity because they were not bound so much by the law. Today, Shah Rukh Khan has to go and plead with ministers saying, let my uh, film be seen. Don't be carried away by the Sharmi Rang. Right? So, is that law or is that lawlessness? Anybody's guess. So, if I may ask something on the similar line. Uh, so, we got to learn about Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Rousseau, and other thinkers. But, sir, uh, since the time of civilization, you also mentioned about civilization. Uh, don't you think law would have been something that would that was always present? Like today, it is codified in form of a constitution, in form of penal codes. But earlier in those days, centuries ago, f uh, with the inception of civilization, law would always form a part of the society. Doubtlessly, well, doubtlessly, society by definition is the giving up of rights and uh, a repository of these rights converting themselves into common good for people. After all, when 10 people drew margins on their houses, it's like dogs uh, marking their territories. It's even in, it is not only law is not a human exclusive. Even animals have their laws. How to hunt, where to hunt, which are the animals you hunt, how do you hunt them, are all the, you know, some rudimentary format of understanding human limitation and as believing that the human spirit is not so omnipresent that you can do whatever you want, wherever you want, whenever you want. Having said that, that balance that you have to make now, between a totalitarian regime, where there are so many laws which seem to be functional from the keyhole of giving socio-economic welfare to the citizen, to the extreme Smith, Adam Smith, Nazafair paradigm of a society where everything is left to its entrepreneurs to determine, develop, and grow a more rand world than anything else. Uh, the virtue of capitalism, to take rand, for example. We were believed in the uh, Nehruvian uh, mix and match. You know, get a little of this, get a little of that. See if we can get to that perfect shade of gray between black and white and live it out. And I think somewhere that is, you know, the mean is always the, uh, the mean is the best place to be in. It's the most comforting arithmetic space. And so I would conclude that in the context that yes, law has been a historic parallel to society. It's arguably as old as society, if not as old as man. Because the factum of society is a combination of individual interests, learning to live together, and that summation of the more than the whole of the total number of people manifests itself in certain do's and don'ts, which very rudimentarily is referred to as law. So we Thank completely you, understand the way you want to speak. So we completely understand what is uh, how important law is for the society. But sir, according to you, uh, like uh, like people say, like justice delayed is justice denied. Like we all know what <coughs> happened in Nirvaya case. 
uh, all the people came in roads, protested for justice, but it took years. So, sir, according to you, is justice delayed, justice denied? I don't know. Again, there is a midpoint. Justice delayed is justice denied. Justice hurried is justice buried. Right? Now, you must understand in the third world country, uh, the challenge is not just about when you get delivery of justice. <clears throat> you know, let's take a let's take the example for bus. Say, uh, when you stay, Aditya, you stay in Bangalore? Yes, sir, Bangalore. Okay, the city of traffic jams. Yes. Sir. Now, suppose you're taking a bus, say, from Anil Kumble Square at MG Road and going somewhere to a place like, say, Baswangudi or, or Jayanagar or somewhere. Now, there's a bus that comes. It's a nice, swanky new bus, but its capacity is only 60 people. Now, if 175 people get into the 60 people bus, the 10 minute journey from Anil Kumble Square to Jayanagar or Baswangudi is going to take half an hour instead of 10 minutes. Now, every one of these 120 people, Kwe the 40 who should be traveling in the bus, are all suffering because of the over number of passengers bringing down the speed and efficiency of the bus. Correct? It's the same physics that works in the jurisprudential space of Indian law. You know, we all compare American law with, you know, the American judicial system with the Indian judicial system. How many judges sit in the American High Court, Supreme Court? 13, 15, 20, I don't know. And how many judgments do they deliver in a year? 30, 100, 150, 200, 300. A Supreme Court judge in India sitting in a division bench on a Friday alone does 150 cases. On one day, he does what the Supreme Court is delivering in a year over there. Again, okay, look at the efficacy of. Uh, okay, let's look at it like this. Today, if I have a problem with my eye or ear or my heart, I call up my doctor and in half an hour, I'm before my doctor. And by tomorrow, I'm on the surgical uh, table the, and I'm under the scissor. In United States of America, this will take three and a half months. Why? It's simply a number game. It is only a number game. You know, today, we have only two ideas, three ideas about courts and delayed justice in our country. One, that Tariq pe Tariq, Tariq pe Tariq the famous uh, Sunny Diol dialogue from Damini. The second is that courts are responsible for the delays that happen. And the citizen is the sufferer of this delay. And thirdly, that everything else with the system is hunky dory. Now let me do away with each of these three myths. The first, Tariq pe Tariq. No, no judge is interested in just adjourning matters. No lawyer is interested. Understand, today, let's take a simple case of a trial happening between a landlord and a tenant. The landlord is complaining that because of delay, he's, his tenant is staying back in the house for a much longer time. Don't forget the tenant is happy because as long as his case does not get a judgment, He's staying happily in that house. But the voice of the tenant is quiet when he talks about delay in this country. Let's take a student who has less attendance, moves the court, and gets an order in first year of graduation saying, let me take the examination even if my attendance is less. He gets an order from the court for whatever reason. We are not discussing the software. We are discussing the hardware. He goes, takes the examination, he finishes first year, emboldened by the fact that this can happen to him again. He again has shortage of attendance in the second year and takes the second year examination in manner similar. Now he passes first year, passes second year. 
the equity shifts towards him. And because of the delay in the system in the third year, notwithstanding the technicality of the law, he can graduate. So in whose favor is this delay working? Are there no beneficiaries to this delay that happens in the system? Are the number of beneficiaries any less than the numbers who complain of this delay in the system? Therefore, this wolf cry of delay needs to be tempered and examined. One, two, there is no doubt that we have lakhs and lakhs of cases pending across the country. But then why? Why is it that we have uh, only 20 doctors in a government hospital where in the same equivalent, in a private hospital, we have 75. You have privatized medicine, isn't it? Why don't you have Mande Mataram judicial system? Upgrade the judges. Upgrade the wherewithal of the legal fraternity. Upgrade them with computers, hardware, software, and see whether they deliver or not. At 7 o'clock in the evening, why don't we have cross-examination of witnesses in the houses of judges and pay them more? Are they willing to do that? The government finds it very easy to sit down and say, oh, our paas justice delayed. It is the poverty of the system. And a new fund WhatsApp mantra, the, the, the experts from the WhatsApp university who are willing to throw names, throw muck at everybody and anybody. So I don't believe that justice delayed is justice denied. On the other hand, let's take a case where somebody, there's a criminal case against somebody. Within one year, two years, I, I can tell you in our own state, in the, in the state of Andhra Pradesh, erstwhile, I must throw water, hot water. A case against a person for rape and killing of a girl, he was convicted. Suppose you had sentenced him and killed him. What happened? In appeal, the sentence was set aside. Would you have not killed an innocent guy? So justice hurried sometimes can be justice worried. How do you draw the line between these two? Up your infrastructure, ask questions before you criticize. While the citizen has legitimate reasons to believe that the justice system is inefficient because it is not delivering on time. Does it apply the same thing? The same thing happens with the legal system. We are all Sapchanta Indian. How many of us <coughs> on a date with our girlfriend are willing to be there on time? Simple act, we are late. Aditya suddenly remembers that first date he had with her, he went late and what all happened after that. So it happens with the judges. And this is a huge system crumbling under its own weight. Its aesthetics are gone. It's highly elitist. I have no doubts about it. But the last of the complaints I have against my system is delay. Sir, like, uh, what's your suggestion? Like, how to improve the situation? One hand, we see, like, if we try to <coughs> complete the case fast, we tend to deviate from the judgment. A wrong judgment might be given. I think the or Indian, or there some... must be a gen, I think there must be an Indian Judicial Administrative Service. Which must administer the judicial machinery and leave it to judges to judge the matter. Judges are not trained management scholars. They don't know management. It is not their business. They are, it is not in their equipment to manage jurisprudential controversies. Their job is to ensure answers to litigation. Leave that part to them and manage the larger picture by an administrative system. 
right um thank you so much sir so the question is about uh, the digitalization of judiciary so what is the way forward sir especially now we have been seeing online hearings the online cases going on live uh, we are having the courts coming live so is digitalization of judiciary necessary is my first question and secondly we have a lot of infrastructural challenges like hacking uh, privacy protection so taking into consideration all this uh, how do you view this uh, the entire setup of digitalization of our judiciary in india with, with specifically with prashanti you must understand prashanti you will understand that no new issue comes without its problems society is work in progress so is the judicial system we all in our fairness in our fairness india technology qua the judicial system function reasonably well given the covid challenges of 2020 we did reasonably did we did the best no we did but we did reasonably well now that became a launch pad for us to imagine virtual hearings on a more permanent basis there are different high courts different views you know also there's a huge uh, ego issues with judges and you must understand that ego is a good co-traveler with ignorance many of our judges strongly believe they know everything under the sky and think it's intra dig to get acclimatized with the nuances of modern technology the inertia of living in a mindset in a feudal system is higher than in a modern capitalistic system this is a given so unless you change the feudal mindset of my system i am afraid that all technological advances that we are talking about will at best be cosmetic development is insidious it has a way of creeping into our system you know from the just today uh, justice narsimha who has come to our court today just from the supreme court the similarities without us even realizing we moved from typewriter to teleprinter to microsoft to whatsapp we moved without being conscious about it from cyclo styling to photocopying was not a conscious decision we were we were we are part of the dust that the flood carries with it and therefore at some point in time the judiciary will either have to change or will become irrelevant don't forget that if the judicial system outlives its utility by virtue of being a dinosaurus then it will suffer the same consequences of the dinosaurs it is in the interest of the justice management system in the country it is in the larger interest of the status quoists of the country to ensure that there is a reasonable growth of technology and acceptance of it within the system so that you are not right there but you are not so far behind so the the superimposition of or at least the juxtapositioning of technology with the judicial managerial wing of our system is inevitable how how far will the speed will the bandwidth take it all or is bandwidth just a physical term or is the knowledge bandwidth also an important input how much does Uh, how when will law school start teaching technology to students all various challenges that will come up and i'm sure we will deal with it provided we have first aid the understanding that technology is inevitable and then too understand that technology grows and if we are not fast enough to learn we will be learning something which is not relevant Uh, it's so like just, you know, for example today i learning what is facebook it's already dated 
Nobody goes to Facebook today. So can it be an alternative to the uh, physical court or the physical um, hearings it happens? In my lifetime, I think physical court will be there. Another 10, 20 years it will be there. It won't, we won't have a Singapore-like scenario. And don't forget, even America, Britain today have physical courts. It's not as if only India is running physical courts and it's backward. Best of countries have physical court because human communications effectiveness, man to man, eye to eye, is a wholly different ballgame. Right? <coughs> and I believe science technology must accentuate advantages without robbing you of your initial strengths. Therefore, the lawyer who's willing to stand before the judge must not be deprived of that liberty simply because technology offers him to sit at home and argue. So just in, in fact, unless over a period, uh, one, uh, let me just finish. Unless yes. Prashanti, over a period of time, we have all become our mind moved completely to a system wherein communication on a web portal is more effective than physical communication, which I, I suspect is a little far away. Right, sir. So just an inference from the discussion that we just had. So is it right for me to understand that our system is more flexible? It's more adaptable to the environment, specifically the technological environment in 21st century? Mm, that would be making a virtue out of necessity. We are flexible because we don't have the wherewithal. We are flexible because we are all not trained enough. We are flexible because we were caught up in a time wrap where we didn't know the technology had overtaken us so fast. We are flexible because we don't know what are the other opportunities that technology offers to us in the judicial space. It is in that context that we are still very flexible. It's a complacence leading to flexibility scenario. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, Divyanshu can take it. Divyanshu, Divyanshu I can't hear you. I think you are, you'll have to unmute. Divyanshu, you're still muted. All three of you are muted. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, no, Divyanshu, you're on mute still. Um, I'll try to unmute you. But I'm unable to do that. I'll just try with the Divyanshu, but we'll just go ahead. With, Aditya um, tried and succeeded. Yeah, yeah. So Aditya can go ahead. We will come back to Divyanshu. Yes, sir. Sir, like often we hear about the tussle between the courts and the parliament. Uh, like uh, one hand, we have uh, uh, we have the court who has uh, judicial activism of power in which he checks all the action of a state. On the other hand, we see the parliament having the power to amend the decision given by the courts. So, sir, where is the checks and balance? Like, where is the midway? And, sir, if uh, the parliament has the power to amend the judgment, given by court so so how can we say like uh, indian judiciary is independent well various factors can do that finally aditya a system is as good as the men who man it don't forget that any system is just as good as the men who man it lord warren american chief justice said the law is what we say it is the balance of power between the executive and the judiciary has a historic ups and downs. The Nehruvian era, Nehru always felt that the judiciary was stonewalling every progressive step that he was taking. Mrs. Gandhi's time, Mrs. Indira Gandhi's time, she played with the judiciary. Men like H.R. Gokhale, Siddharth Shankar Ray, all lawyers in their own metal 
spoke about a committed judiciary. Luckily for us, around the same time, we had giants of the judicial system, Krishna, Ayer, Justice Desa, Justice Bhagavati, Justice Chinaparadi, Justice H.R. Kanna, who could stand up to the pressures, power pressures, I'm not even talking about personal pressures. Today again, we are reaching, uh, the, I think uh, the government is on a tour of uh, brinksmanship with the judiciary. And comments that the judicial members don't have to face the constituency once in five years. While factually is correct, it's philosophically wrong. It is dangerous to say to the consequence of that statement is that judges also must be populist, which would mean if 100 people want a named person as a rapist be killed, then you kill him. So the layman's number game, with due respect to Plato, is suddenly becomes majoritarian. Law is not majoritarian. The making of a law is majoritarian. The implementation of law is not majoritarian. It's not a jury system, right? Therefore, this who is more powerful than the other? The man who wields more power is more powerful than the other. As simple as that. You know, war, intelligence who gets the better of your ammunition. <coughs> Today, I believe, and I'm saying this with a certain sense of responsibility. I know I'm quoted in public. I think that the wherewithal of many judicial wordsmiths is suspect. Therefore, giving rise to a general belief that the efficiency quotient of judges is suspect. On the other hand, the populist stance of a popular man is throwing its shadow so strongly around everything and anything that happens during and under his regime that people are unwilling to stand up and say something. Interestingly, in uh, Gandhi versus Nathuram Khotse, ek, ek youth or whatever, the new film by, uh, that was released yesterday. Nathuram Khotse mouths the sentence <coughs> against Gandhi. He says, no man, no man is greater than the state, the law, and the institution. <clears throat> Let's apply that to some contemporary leaders. And then we will realize with humility that both sides of this fence are erring. Both sides of this fence, <coughs> like on the eastern glaciers, will have to retrieve a little, announce a ceasefire, and go back a little, and then allow things to function under normals. This war situation that's happening in the Northeast is happening right in the center of this country. It is not good. I don't think there is a structural problem with the law in this country. If the judicial, the law and the system is very clear that if the law is made by parliament, the court will test it from the constitutional angle alone. And the best way of testing it is by the number of judges who decide a majoritarian view. Then, if that law is not suitable or if they show you the drawbacks of your law, you are always entitled to make a new law. 
not to overcome the judgment, but to ensure that the demerits of your law are all right. That is the law, do it. Instead of you, every day one of you barking at the other, set your house in order. If the Supreme Court is telling you that a certain law is not in accordance with the Constitution, if it is not, let us look at people today are criticizing Keshavan and the Bharti. Do they understand the historic, the historic from the womb of the emergency Keshavan and the Bharti came out? Do we forget what happened during the emergency? Is the government today, which is talking ill of Keshavananda Bharati, ready to stand by the emergency? If not, then Keshavananda Bharati is the right answer. It's not an over, over enthusiastic judicial system, but a judicial system that understood the nuances of the constitution and saved us. <coughs> Yes, the next. Divyanshu, have you got? I'll just. Are you back in a meeting? I'll call you back. Yeah. Yes, proceed. Yes, sir. Uh, we started the conversation with the idea of law and society. And now, when we are towards the end, uh, let us bring that point again. Uh, I have always seen or I have always felt that law is a factor, law is a reason behind the social changes that occur. When Sati was there in practice, people realized that this is the custom and adopted something which, which was accepted socially then, but in today's time will be considered as irrational. And then law came in and changed that societal evil, banned it. When the cases of domestic violence were reported, when cases of marital rapes were reported, laws have been constructed to stop these practices. I want to, I want, I want to request you to kindly enlighten our audience on how law becomes a reason, a force, a factor, an inspiration behind the social change. Because one thing that comes with law is the sense of obedience, which is not there in norms. Law never inspires. Law never inspires. It commands. It dictates. I also believe that law walks in after an evil becomes a practice. Unless it is a imported vision experience from elsewhere. For example, before our country got as polluted as it is today, we made laws on pollution, of course, which we violate. That's a different matter from Western countries where experience of industrialization had caused enough pollution. So we did not wait for it, we made the laws. So what happens is a law is a societal and acceptance of a method to deal with a socio-political economic challenge. It is put into a certain structure and the structure is required to be followed and normally, there is a price you pay for not following this structure. Correct? Both in civil and in criminal. For example, in civil law, if you do not register a property that you want to buy, the price you pay for it is it will not be recognized as your property. So if the price you pay for not uh, having a license for your car, is that your car can be taken away by somebody without any proof and you can't have an insurance and all that happens with insurance. If you do not follow the law that your house has boundaries just as your neighbor has, then the law of trespass comes. So what are all these examples telling us? That man's intent and eye on somebody's property make the law of trespass necessary. The law of man's ambition to own somebody else's property became the starting point for men to recognize their property <laughs> through documentation. Take dowry, for example. After years, after decades and decades of men killing women, 
or women being killed by men, women, whoever. Law came in to say, no, from now, if a lady dies within a married scenario, within a period of 12 years, then it's for the husband to prove that she died naturally, that he had no, nothing to do with it. So the onus of establishing that you are not guilty is in contradistinction to, in most other cases, having to prove that you, for the prosecution to prove that you are guilty. So this paradigm shift happened because there was an evil that an agency needed to police by a stated mechanism. And that stated mechanism is the anti dowdy prohibition law. <coughs> so law always is an instrument created by the status quoists. <coughs> it is an instrument measured in proportion to what society envisages as good or evil and has a price if violated. It is not inspirational. Yes, sir. That's a fine takeaway today. Like law is the product of lawlessness. When lawlessness occurs, we come up together and decide that it needs to be stopped. And let us bring in a law so that it commands and dictates our behavior, which shall be uh, in accordance to the social good, the larger good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so the question now is about how is the legal system in India favorable for women? So we have a lot of acts such as the Domestic Violence Act or Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Act and all. So from a student perspective, if I go and tell my parents and relatives after this was the case, like after I was done with my 12th standard, I want to do my graduation in Delhi. So immediately everybody was so skeptical about it. They were like, after seven I know years, where you're heading. I know where you're heading. They were My like, only after parents, seven... even others told you don't go to Delhi. Sir, in fact, you told me. You also advised me that it's not safe right now to go to Delhi. So, yes. sir, is it favorable for women? It's the national capital of our country. No, but uh, Prashanti, I didn't say don't go to Delhi to do law. I said don't go to Delhi, period. Uh, sorry, sir. For, for BA. I didn't say don't go to Delhi to do law. I said don't go to Delhi, period. It had nothing to do with law. It had something to do with Delhi. Yeah, so my question is, there is this question of safety when it comes to the uh, when it comes to women. It's always okay. advised. So like how favorable yes, is that, the legal system in India? I don't know. I don't know. Because even today, the prosecutions have gone up the punish conviction rate is alarmingly low because the society is unsafe for women society continues to be unsafe for women today the moment somebody says that a woman has been raped the man in every woman included would say don't know what she was wearing don't know what was she doing the night on the roads Right. So a woman's dress is a license to a man's libido. Now that is the sexual mindset of a Indian society. The rape law has which has gotten the death penalty has not stopped gory rape in this country. It's increased. You try telling a rapist that he's going to die if he rapes. And let us see if he will stop it. Rape is not a sexual offense. The day we understand rape only as a sexual offense, we will continue to deal with it wrongly. It's a socio-economic offense of a man trying to say that he's more powerful than a woman. He is trying to establish his superiority. And if, as long as that myth that man is superior to woman continues, women's positioning in a society will always be a challenge of safety. 
give to it the huge lack of education, the lumpenization of urban society, the uh, confluence of Western culture with uh, our non-understanding of what is essentially India, and the huge cleavage between the haves and the have-nots, the rich and the poor, all these will continue to aggravate this unsteady gender relationship in the Indian polity. <coughs> uh, sir, this brings me to one final follow-up question. Sir, is it uh, necessary that the perception of people should be changed? Uh, even though we have a lot of laws, uh, all the regulations, if the perception is not changed fundamentally from the within, I personally feel that the change, I mean, the transformation might not happen. So the perception of an individual should be changed. Is it necessary is my first part of the question. Second part is, is it possible to change the perception of people? Mm, possible, I don't know. Necessary, yes. Possible, why not? We are also human beings. No? We are human beings. Possibly will happen. But you know why it is not happening? We are not only not learning, but we are wrongly learning. Today, instead of learning what happened, we are today finding it very convenient to say, we only know about Lord Delauzi, we only know about Adolzi, we only know about Akbar, we don't know about what happened in Taksila. Go and tell your children, yeah, why are you blaming the university for it? Is it not your responsibility? Why do parents believe that paying tuition fees, their parenthood is over? A parent's job is buying uh, paying tuition fees, buying clothes, buying good uh, things that the child needs. Education is no part of a parent's job. How many parents spend quality time with their children to find out what the freak is happening in their minds? Every parent wants to know how many marks his son got without knowing how much his child has learned. We are Marxists that way across the country. We all want to know how many marks. We don't care what our children are learning. We send them to concentration camps. Peer pressure. Did you get 98? Did you get 99? Otherwise, you are not fit. Children begin to laugh. And where do these children learn all these from? From their parents. Every parent lies in our country. That's why children lie in our country. Every parent breaks the law in this country. That's why children break the law in this country. Dad doesn't mind not wearing the helmet while dropping his son in school. Papa doesn't mind putting his son in an auto where there are nine or ten children going. We don't mind uh, bribing a police officer right in front of our children. We don't mind bribing and getting a black market ticket on a Sunday for a film. These are the moorings that we give our children and that's what they are going to learn. Children learn how you get a two-tire birth because you can't give up the luxury of one night's sleep. You think it's better to bribe a TC in a train. This child, the child notices. So he knows how to come out of the system. We, as a, I as a generation and my next two, do not have the moral wherewithal to tell the next generation to be honest. And that is a huge challenge. What do we teach our children in schools? We had a chief minister in a state who said, don't waste time on social studies. Teach them maths, biology, physics, and chemistry. This is the nadir of education. If somebody says like the Divyanshu or Aditya, I'm doing history and English, people say, oh, school maths means seek me, I usle ye karta hai. This is the pathetic level. If you want to change your country, go and revisit the parameters of your education system. We have moved away, far, far away from the pre post -Nehru, from the Nehruvian liberal system to whatever we have today. 
And what do all our computer engineers end up doing? BPO jobs. And you expect yeah. my judges to be good managers of the system. Right, sir. Here's where the life skills comes into play. Right from the family, a child literally sees their parents and that's how the child is groomed. That's how the child is brought up. So parenting plays a very important role. And also, sir, um, when we talk about this right from, I guess, in, in every aspect, the foundation is this life skills. And that's how we develop. We start from home. And then whatever we do, whatever we learn here, that is what is executed outside. So that was the foundation of this entire talk, I would say. So, Divyanshu, would you like to add on something? Yeah, the last part. Uh, so a lot of takeaways, but three things that will definitely stick with me for, for my lifetime is justice delayed, justice denied, justice hurried, justice buried. The second being law is the product of the lawlessness. And the third one that if you want to change the notion of the society, the social setup, change the parameters of education system. That was perhaps the best ending we could have got for this conversation that if you want to bring a change start by changing the pathetic condition that's the appropriate word uh, that <coughs> even sir uh, start by changing altering amending that pathetic condition that the education system has turned into unfortunately uh, so on the behalf of the ALB Academy, on the behalf of the office peers, on the behalf of Prashanti and myself, I extend my sincere gratitude to you that you took out your time, you interacted with us. I'm sure the audience that who is sitting uh, in their homes, they are watching it, they have learned a lot and uh, definitely uh, we, we will request you, we will approach you again for certain interactions like these where learning is really immense I extend my sincere gratitude and respect to you. And on the behalf of Academy, we pray for your health. We pray for your good life. Uh, dear viewers, so uh, we come to the end of this program. I hope you all stay tuned, attentive, and got a lot to learn from Sir and from the questions framed by the team. Uh, on uh, 29th of this month, we will be... Uh, having the Bank of Doha's chairman, the chairman of Bank of Doha will be amongst us and he would be sharing his uh, beautiful, inspiring experiences on life and economy and the link and the access to those uh, interactions will be provided to you through the social media handles and we will see you again in that conversation. Until that time, take care. Thank you. Devanshu, just before I sign so, off, I must really please. take a minute of please. your time. I think the wonderful initiative that the three of you are doing, and I strongly believe that these kind of initiatives are those oases in this desert called Indian education. I'm a very strong critic of the manner and pattern and the mechanics of our education, and it's wonderful to see the three youngsters like the three of you are sensitized into the belief that exposure, opening up windows, getting uh, men who completely differ from one another the space for understanding new ideas is so, so important. And it's wonderful that three young minds, I'm reminded of, I, and I think I've said this so often, you know, the famous poet Pradeep said, Hum hai tu se nikal kar, is desh ko mere it's, I, I have a feeling it is now in safe hands. Uh, thank you for uh, making me a part of this initiative. It's very uh, humbling to believe that I'm with such wonderful minds and thinkers and I hope that uh, this nation moves towards a better tomorrow than the ghastly present and Prashanti if you can give me the connect to this whole thing at some point in time I'd love to say <coughs> record it and keep it somewhere and savor it for times to come and also uh, get back to me personally about my uh, possibility of catching up with all of you next Saturday at Christ. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. A hopeful journey is always better than reaching the destination. We will try our best. Thank you so much, sir. Pleasure and honor. It was all ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.